on our connecting flight yesterday. I was reading, I have a book that's uh, uh, The Complete Sayings of Jesus. It's, it's extracting all the words of Christ. And I was just reading it. And as I was reading it, I came to the wedding in Cana. And as the Lord began to speak to me, He said, we're coming into the bridal season. We're coming into the body of Christ, the purposes of God in the earth. We're coming into the bridal season. And I began to, to look at Kitty, and the Spirit of the Lord came on me, and, and I began to weep, and I had a really hard time containing myself, and I don't think you want to start crying on an aircraft. <laughs> okay. And, uh, but the more I read, and it just, it's like I could feel, as much as I was seeing from my end of this word, I could feel the Holy Ghost like pushing himself against the glass. He was wanting to break through into my understanding from his side of the glory to see this word to to come out and be connected in people's thinking but he told me we're coming into the bridal season of God and I want to look at some verses in John chapter 2 verse 1 it says the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. It's interesting that Walter was talking about three days earlier. Did y'all hear that? And I kept looking at Kitty and saying, there's the third day. Because we're in a third day season. And that's, if, you, if you're listening at all, that's nothing new. We've heard that before. But I just want to rehearse some of it. And what do we mean when we're in a third day season? It's one thing to say that. It's another thing to understand it from the scriptures. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Peter begins to talk about the Kairos timing of God. He says, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So, from God's perspective, we're still in the first week of creation. We're in the seventh day from creation, from God's point of view. The seventh day from Adam, the third day from the resurrection. Because we've had now just over 2,000 years. So that puts us into God's third day. Hebrews chapter 6 talks about it like this. That's the verse, in, 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 it's verses 1 through 3, but I'm only going to quote 2. But it's where he says, Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, He will come to us as the latter rain, as the former and the latter rain upon the earth. The former and the latter rain upon the earth is old covenant power, with new, new covenant grace being poured out in one season to mature the harvest for the end of the age. Amen. And he says in verse 2 of Hosea, he said, After two days, he will revive us. What happened in the second day? In the first 1,000 years after the resurrection, we found uh, the earth racked by plague. A third of humanity was dying of the black plague. They had three years of unexplained darkness. There were apocalyptic groups throughout the Middle Ages who thought the end of the age had come upon them. He says, we, we were broken. We found ourselves in a, in a great difficulty. But then in the second day, we have the Renaissance. We have Martin Luther. In the second day, he revived us. But then in the third day, it's one thing to be revived. But what's, what's he doing now in this millennia? He's going to raise us up and we're going to live in his sight. No more believing, not just walking in believing, but we're walking in appropriation of that which we believe. We have forensically experienced that which we've been trusting for all of this season. Amen. See, everything that Jesus did had a significance. So when he went to this bridal company on the third day, it's something that points to our time. Jesus didn't do anything without meaning or without significance. Now, just a few third-day uh, incidences or events in the Bible. We're just going to quote them, and you can study them later. This eventually will make its way to YouTube. The third day, Abraham offered Isaac on the third day, Genesis 22.4. So the third day is a covenantal day. God met Moses on the mountain when he came down in the cloud. 
And the people didn't want to go up. They said, Moses, you go up. We don't want to go up. And he went up and he came down and his face shone for the first time in the presence of God. So it's the third, that's in uh, Exodus 19.11. The third day is a day of visitation. Over and over again we hear God saying prophetically, you're going to receive a visitation. You're going to have, I'm going to come to you in visitation. Not just in, in your mind's eye. That's a legitimate vision. Just like Joseph, the angel came to Joseph in a dream. That's legitimate angelic visitation. But we're talking about open eye visitation of the Holy Ghost upon your life. It's a day of visitation. Joshua crossed over into the promised land on the third day. Joshua 3.2 David came to power on the third day. 2 Samuel chapter 1 verse 2 The day that Saul died is the day that David's kingdom was established to him. That's the day that Saul dies. And the first place he dies is on the inside of you. <laughs> See? The, the, in, the inner Saul dies and then the outward Saul is toppled. Amen? Because those giants, listen, the giants that you're facing are a reflection of an inward victory that must come. And when the inward giants are slain by the five smooth stones of the David on the inside of you, then the outward giants will fall. That's why the scripture says, better is he that rules his spirit than he that takes a city. If you defeat, if you come to the inward victory, the outward victory is just follow through. Hezekiah, 2 Kings chapter 20 verse 5, Hezekiah was healed and his life was extended on the third day. Ezra, when they built the restoration temple, Ezra completed the restoration temple in Ezra 6.15 on the third day. Esther, what did we say? We're coming into a bridal season. And we all have such a powerful prophetic imagery of, of the king extending the scepter to es Esther and said unto the half of his kingdom. At that point, anything that she asked for he was required by law to grant. The day that he did that is said in the scripture in Esther 5.1, it was the third day that the scepter was lowered. Now what does that mean? It's a picture of righteousness. Jesus, 1 Corinthians 1.30, Jesus is your righteousness. What does that mean? That means that God moves in your life not because of who you are or what you've done, but because of who Jesus is and what he did for you on Calvary. What does that look like uh, in the trenches? In the trenches, it means everything you say and do becomes as effective as if he said it or did it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Jonah was released from the belly of the whale. Jonah 1.17 on the third day. How many of you are, you know, think, you wake up and say, something's fishy. Well, when something's fishy, it's because you're in the belly of the whale. And we want to, and Jesus rose, Matthew 16, 21, on the third day. So the third day, it's a day of covenant. It's a day of visitation. It's a day of crossing over. It's a day of promotion, healing, restoration, deliverance, mercy. Bridal fulfillment and resurrection. And this is the day that we're living in. So it's a day of consummation. It's a day of fulfillment. And I keep hearing the Holy Ghost say, The sky isn't falling. The kingdom is coming. The sky isn't falling. The kingdom is coming. We're not concerned with what's happening in the economy because you're connected to the economy of the kingdom. It's not what happens in the Oval Office that controls what's happening with you it's what's happening before the throne you're connected to that your your life is responding to what's happening on the throne not what's happening in the oval office not what's happening in tehran not what's happening in korea it's what's happening before the throne we are as the children of israel in the land of goshen and if he preserved them while he brought egypt to his knees Amen. how much more is he preserving us because we're walking in the glory of an unfading grace not the fading glory of the law of sin and death. So are we going to believe God or are we going to believe Chicken Little? We're going to believe God. <laughs> so the wedding scene. Everything Jesus did at the wedding was prophetic. He knew he was fulfilling prophecy. 
He knew he was fulfilling. Now listen. He knew he was fulfilling prophecy past, present, and future. And you think about that, and I hope you get out of that what I got out of it when God gave it to me. John 2.2. 2. So Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Jesus wasn't the only one called to the marriage. He didn't attend the wedding alone. Jesus, what are you doing? We asked that many times. God, what are you doing? Why? Because we don't know if we could take much more. <laughs> Jesus, what are you doing? He said, I'm bringing my disciples to the wedding. What's a disciple? He's the one who takes up his cross. And when he said that, he was, not, he was not making a a petulant statement. He wasn't saying, well, if you're going to follow me, you better be ready to lay down your life for me. That was not what he was saying. He was speaking from a position of pragmatism. He was basically saying this, look, I know what it takes to follow my father. And if you're not walking in self-denial, you're not going to make it. He wasn't doing the carrot and stick thing. Mm -hmm. He was explaining, look, I know this walk. I know the end from the beginning. I know for you to get to the end of the process, to appropriate the promise. Where is your promise, God? It's at the end of the process that, that is pressing you now. And the only way you're going to survive the, uh, the, the time frame that the process plays out in your life and you're feeling the sea. That's why Acts 14.22, he said, it is through much tribulation you enter the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Paul went out in Acts on his first missionary journey. He created a riot everywhere he went. He didn't appoint one pastor, didn't raise up one elder. He got to the end of his mission, first missionary journey, go look it up, and he turned around and went back to every one of those churches, and he appointed elders, he, he confirmed the saints, you look that word up, it means he laid hands on them and he prophesied. And he exhorted them, that is through much tribulation that you enter into the kingdom. That word tribulation means manifold, different kinds of pressure. So we have to learn not to get cyclical when we're in the pressure zone. Otherwise, you're going around in circles and there's no end to it. But if you stay uh, linear in your thinking while you're in the pressure zone, you're turning into the pressure because you don't want to turn back. Because he says, my soul has no pleasure. You turn back to perdition. You turn back to loss. The vintage is lost if you try and go back. There is no going back. You press into the pressure. You turn into the pressure and you break out into the kingdom and everything you say and do becomes as effective <coughs> as if he said it or did it. Yes, so he's bringing his disciples to the wedding. Why? Because Ephesians 5 tells us, verse 27, that his purpose is to present to himself a glorious church, not having spot <coughs> or wrinkle. How do you get wrinkles out? Heat and pressure. Mm -hmm. Or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, the Lord said this to me. The bridal season is now and not later. It's now. It's on this side of eternity and not on the other side of eternity. Now the wedding is for here and now, not there and then. It is eternity now, not eternity then. How do we know this? Because when you look in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, you see the bride... Bring forth a child. She's pregnant with a child and she brings forth this child. And I don't know about you, but I believe there was a wedding that took place before the conception and gestation of what is brought forth in Revelation chapter 12. Mm -hmm. So the bridal season, whatever that means for us in the body of Christ, the bridal season is on this side of eternity. It's not we're all going to go to heaven whether we die or whether we're raptured and then we'll be the spotless bride. No, we're going to be spotless here. We're going to be the bride here. The, the wedding's going to be consummated here. We're going to walk in the bridal company here and now. And you and I get to be a part of that. Amen. 
So we get to participate in the, in the consummation of the bridal season of God. And in the bridal season, business as usual in the church, church as we know it. In the bridal season, church as we know it gives way to church as he wants it. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Now how do we know we're in the bridal season? John 2, 3. It says, when they wanted wine... The mother of Jesus said unto them, they have no wine. Wine is a type of joy. If you want to know whether you're in the bridal season, look around for the joy. Is there a dearth of joy? Is there a lack of joy? When you're wanting wine, it's because you're in the bridal season. It's like one elder of mine, he said, everybody wants a miracle, nobody wants to be desperate. <laughs> but God has a solution to that. Where there is, and it's interesting, the scripture says in Isaiah 55, he says, not only is there no joy, but there's no leading. Why is it people are so hungry for the prophetic? Because they want to know what God wants. They want to know the leading of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because they don't have it. Because he said in Isaiah 55, 12, you'll go out with joy and be led forth with peace. His leading doesn't come through understanding. His leading comes through his joy. Through what makes your heart leap. And so people have no leading. They don't know. I just want to know what God wants in my life. What God wants in your life comes in a packet of joy, not in a packet of intellect. It doesn't come in a packet of understanding. If, if, if God's leading for you, where He's taking you, comes in a packet of understanding, He can only reproduce what you've already experienced because what you've experienced is what you understand. Right. He doesn't want, he's go, he's, he's, He told us one time, do you want peace or do you want understanding? You can't have both. But if you will relinquish understanding, He will send you your leading. He will send you the, the breaker anointing will be poured out in your life from a packet of joy that will come to you. And you will go out with joy and your friends will say, what are you doing? He says, I have no earthly idea. Ain't it cool? <laughs> <laughs> See, the joy of God and the peace of God are intimately connected with the mind of God. And what he would have you to do. Now, let's talk about provoking the accelerated hand of God. You ever hear the term? I hear it in my spirit a lot. God speed acceleration. See, you can pray the sooner not later prayer. <laughs> but when you pray the sooner not later prayer, the angel leans over and he says, <clears throat> Return your tray to the upright position. And fasten your seatbelt. We're going to experience a little turbulence here. There will be no drink service for a little while because you know we want all of the flight attendants to take their to get in their jump seats because it's going to be a little turbulence. That's true. See why? Because that's the turbulence that you push through to break out into the kingdom, the Amen. righteousness, joy, and peace. God is 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 pressuring us to bring you into a place where everything you say and do becomes as effective as if he said it or did it. Amen. Come on. Let's have that. Yeah. Amen. So they have no wine. They have no joy. Verse 4. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. See, what Jesus is about to do, it doesn't look like it's time for it yet. But something transpired in the heart of Mary that moved the timetable of God. He said it isn't time. But he didn't say he wouldn't do it. He just said it wasn't time. But he didn't say he wouldn't do it. Because you can move the hand of God ahead of his own timetable. By one thing, she turns around and he says to the servants, whatever he tells you, do it. Let me tell you something. There comes a point where God has a timetable just because he wants to see how bad you want it. There have been times Kitty and I have been criticized, sorely criticized. 
seriously criticize. Anathema Maranatha type criticism. <laughs> God's going to kill you if you don't do what we say criticism. Alright, you just gave a prophecy that will come to pass. When is God going to kill me? Soon. Okay, soon. So if I'm not dead in three years, let's call three years soon, I'm going to come back to you and you're going to repent because you're prophesying to me out of an old covenant paradigm rather than a new covenant paradigm? Well, we're not talking about me. We're talking about you. Okay, well, you know, we know how that works out. <laughs> See, people have said, I don't have a problem with what you're doing. I just have a problem with the timing. Well, let me tell you something. God puts the timing in your hands more than you know. Yeah. That's yeah. right. And you can accelerate the hand of God by doing exactly what... See, the scripture says that the church, in Hebrews it says the church is the mother of us all. How come the church isn't saying this? How come the church is so possessed with the mentality of not wanting to look beyond still waters and green pastures that they're not looking at the hearts of broken people and saying, whatever he says unto you, do it. And we won't just have a building fund, we'll have a bail fund. And you can't make a mess that he can't clean up. Amen. And we're going to stand by you and we're going to fellowship your deficits as well as your assets. Yes. And we'll stand behind you even if you make our church look bad. Where is the church that's going to stand behind the people of God and put, give them uh, water pistols full of gasoline to charge the gates of hell with because they're not going to take no for an answer? Yes. Amen. Yes, yes Lord. His mother said unto the servants, the servants, <laughs> whatever he says unto you, do it. See, there'll be people that run out if they're not servants. They'll run out. Oh, I'm just doing what I see my father do, but God ain't their father. See, this teaching, John 5, 19, Jesus said, I only do what I see my father do. He wasn't eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, folks. He wasn't operating according to a perceived principle of spiritual morality. He said, man should not live by bread alone. You know you got bread, the bread from heaven. How come it's not working out? You live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You've got Jesus in your heart, and you're responding to where he's taking you. And, and it's, he speaks to you not according to the polar opposites of like looking at a pinball machine, and you're bouncing between the buffers of spiritual principles, but he's giving you the guiding star of his voice. And he speaks to you, and he takes it upon himself. He's go, if he's going to call... Ignoring him disobedience, then he takes it upon himself to see that you have heard his voice. Amen. And he sends the prophets, and he speaks by dreams, and he speaks by visions, and he speaks by portent, synchronicity, serendipity. He will do whatever it takes to get your attention, and when you act, it creates an explosive release of the power of God in your life that brings the breaker anointing that changes every parameter you live by. Thank you, Father. Amen. I only do what I see my Father do. Jesus said. And what did Jesus say? He steps up and he performs a prophetic act. There were there, verse 6, six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Isn't that interesting? I love numbers. I love to study numbers in the scripture. Six is the number of man. Now think about six. Six is bracketed by five and seven. Five is the number of grace. Seven is the number of perfection. So when God brings you into an acceleration season, He brackets you with His grace to cover your humanity. You don't know what I've done, where I've been, what I'm struggling with. It don't matter. To be honest with you, it's not that much of a secret. People see... People of the Spirit can see stuff. <laughs> Love you anyway. Just like you can see stuff. Right. See, this, you, you can use discerning. See, it's discerning of spirits, not discerning of flesh. Paul says, I know in my flesh dwells no good thing. If you want to turn that gift of discernment on me, you can find whatever you want to look for. Yeah. You find it, it's there. Okay? But it's his, his brackets you with His grace in order to bring you to perfection. And that's why he says, I love you. 
no strings attached. Amen. Because he's capable of producing that which he desires in your life. Because what's he doing? He's bringing forth a spotless bride, a bridal company. And so Jesus says, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. Now, think about it. These water pots had two or three firkins apiece. They already had water in them. You've already got water in you. Some had more water than others. What is water? Ephesians 5.26 says it's a type of the word. The water they had in them was not water for wine. Now, think about it. It was water for washing. And we've been putting the word in us and putting the word in us and putting the word in us. Some of us have more word than others and it's trying to clean up. But he's not interested in you cleaning you up because you cannot make yourself eligible for what he's about to do. Amen. This water that was already there was not for wine, it was for washing. And if you have any sincerity in Christ, you will to some degree or another apply yourself to washing yourself and aligning yourself with the Word of God. But human effort to live up to God's expectations will only take you so far. He says, I appreciate the effort, but I got this. It's the gospel according to George Lopez. I appreciate the effort. I see you've been scrubbing behind your ears. I see you've been making an effort, but let me take it from here. See, aligning yourself and washing yourself with the Word is not the problem at the moment. People today look at the world and they say, we just need to clean this world up. We need to get these folks lined up with the washing of the water of the Word. But folks, let me tell you, at the wedding in the bridal season, Jesus isn't planning to wash the people. He's planning to intoxicate them with Himself. There's a difference. I'll take that. Yes, amen. <laughs> See, this is not a wrong answer that, oh, don't we need to clean the world up? That's not a wrong answer, but it's predicated on a wrong question. That's why people get so messed up. They're coming up with right answers to wrong questions. <laughs> we need to get the right questions. <laughs> Jesus is saying, I will get you where you need to be with God, but I will do it by the intoxication of my spirit, not the performance of religious attempts at outward conformity. I don't want to conform you, says the Father. I want to intoxicate you with myself. I want people to look at you and say they're under the influence. Yes. I want you to get a sobriety test. I want you to fail the sobriety checkpoint of the religious crowd because of the intoxication. I don't like the way you oh, I love it. Oh, I don't like the way you talk. I don't like how you conduct yourself. What happens about alcohol? It removes inhibition. He wants to remove the inhibition of the religious mind cause you to step out of your box and begin to live your life according to kingdom parameters rather than cultural Christian parameters of religious death. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Jesus spoke to the men to fill the water pots with water. He wasn't intending to wash them. He was intending to intoxicate them. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Here's a proof text. Scripture, I used to ask the Lord, Scripture, please. Remember where the Bible says, uh, Woe unto you lawyers, Jesus said? How do lawyers win cases? They cite precedents. You know, Judge, in 1945, there was a case just like this in a higher court, and this is how they ruled. Here's my precedent. I want you to rule in my favor. So I thought I was real smart. I would, God would tell me something. And I hadn't heard before, I'd say, Scripture, please. One day he said, you're not a lawyer, are you? <laughs> so for you lawyers, be not drunk with wine. Be not intoxicated under the influence of wine, but be filled with the Spirit. The intoxicants of who I am allow the intoxicants of who I am to come to full absorption in your life. Acts 2.13 is exactly what happened. These men, they said, are full of new wine. Mocking. You'll know you're intoxicated when everybody's pointing at you and laughing. 
<laughs> That's what that meant. For these are not drunken, Peter said, as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour. Third hour. Oh. So cooperation with his process. See, his process is not to clean us up. His process is to intoxicate us. Results in maximum fullness in your life. Notice that Jesus didn't fill the six water pots by himself. He commanded the servants to do it. Are you a servant? Then you have your bridal commission. To pour out of yourself into those around you that are empty. Well, they're not going to receive it. They crucified Jesus. He knew they weren't going to receive it. Do it anyway. What's going to happen if they crucify you? You'll come to resurrection. <laughs> What's the worst that can happen? Resurrection? Let me tell you something. They've tried to crucify us. Uh, we've had our character assassinated. We've been criticized. Those, we've had people that had the means, the method, and the motivation to destroy us in every way you could imagine. And guess what? It was a springboard into a worldwide ministry that's touched the lives of thousands. Thank you, Jesus. Be obedient to God. Be obedient to God and let everybody else cope with what you're drinking. <laughs> He commanded the servants to fill the empty water pots. So the bridal season, the bridal assignment is to pour out of yourself into the people of God until they're full. Now, the thing about fullness, folks, is fullness is based on appetite. Some will get full before you're through feeding. No thanks, I'm full. No thanks, I can't have another bite. No thanks. Huh? Stop. Now I gotta go home. I'll be the designated driver. You go ahead. God, qu He quickened it to you. God bless your pee picking heart. Because they don't want to give up their sobriety. They've worked hard at that religious sobriety. They go to meetings to maintain that sobriety. They have a they have a community whose total purpose is to maintain sobriety from the intoxication that the Father wants to bring. Fullness is based on appetite. How thirsty are you? Some will get full before you're through feeding. But those who will allow themselves to be completely filled, Fill me. Fill me, O oh God. Yes. Intoxicate me with yourself. Intoxicate me till I forget myself. Yes. And wake up and wonder where I'm at and where I was last night. Amen. We all know what that's like. I remember what that was like. Oh, I do too. <laughs> Fill me so full of yourself that I forget myself and awake to your righteousness. Yes. Amen. Those who allow themselves to be completely filled will find taking place inside of them what took place in those water pots. When that water, just plain water, turned into something else. What you're full of. He's not going to give you something you're not full of. He's going to change what's in there. And suddenly what's been in there that is just for washing, just for aligning, just for keeping yourself clean, is going to turn into an intoxication of himself. And you're going to be changed into another man, into another woman. You say, what am I going to do with all this word in me? Wait for it. There are transformational waters working at changing you. So you have to be patient to get everything the servants want to pour out. You have to get it directly from God, but he wants you to cooperate with his process. That's why he said, believe the prophet, so shall you prosper. See? He has a process, and in his process he doesn't want to leave anybody out. So he wants to use those around you to change those around you. It's his, it's his horizontal process by which he reaches to you this way, 
and not this way. This way is pagan Gentile mentality. This way, it's Christ in you that is the hope of glory. Amen. It's Christ in you whose feet I want to wash. Amen. It's Christ in you who's changing me, shaping me. I want to drink. When I drink, I want to drink of who Christ is in you. I want the DNA of who He is in you to be the DNA of who He is in me. I want the paternity that He's established in you to be established in me. I want to take a draught. I don't want to despise the cup and only desire the vintage. I want to accept the cup, the vessel. You have this vessel in earthen or cracked pots. <laughs> I don't know if I want to identify with that. I love the Lord, but I don't, I don't like that guy's reputation. No, we have this vessel in earthen vessels or in cracked pots, and we want to take a deep drink of the vintage. You have to accept the cup and the vintage that he chooses to pour through into your life. That's why he took the cup in Matthew 26, 27, he says, drink ye all of it. To drink until you say, is that all you got? Do you have some more? Is that all you've got? See, there's the drink and there's the cup. There's the earthen vessel who God uses and there's the vintage they pour out. You cannot have a right relationship with the vintage and a wrong relationship to the cup. Who's your prophetic voice? We said this earlier. Who's the prophetic leadership in your life? You know who your pastor is. Do you know who your prophet is? When we get full, what happens? What happened next? They got full. He released the intoxication of himself. What happened next? It says they drew out Verse 8, and took to the ruler of the feast. Who's the ruler of the feast? Is it not God himself? Why did they take the drink to the ruler of the feast? Because he came thirsty. Did you know that God experiences you, your presence, the way you experience his presence when he puts his focus on you and you come under his loving gaze and the glory encapsulates you and you can't even remember your name for the power of God in the room that's exactly how he experiences you what you feel in him is what he's feeling as he is under your scrutiny and your focus he wants his drink and he says I'm thirsty I'm Thirsty, says the Father. I'm thirsting for your presence. I'm thirsting for your human spirit to be poured out upon me like water. That your life would become the vintage that I can partake of. Because I'm thirsting, says the Father. And when he takes his draught of your life, he makes a declaration. He says, I saved the best for last. Amen. He declares, and when God makes a declaration, it's not commentary. It becomes reality in that moment. He says, this is the best. And when he declares it, he breaks off every constraint, every restraint, every limitation, every bit of loss and brokenness. He breaks in your life when he partakes of the draught that you have allowed him to fill you with. Yes. And you enter into the bridal season. Then what happened? John 2.11 says, when he's filled us with himself, when he's taken his drink, then what happened? It says this was the beginning of miracles. What does that mean? It means that the bridal season is transitional. Coming into the bridal season is all about transitioning from a time of prophetic power into a time of signs, miracles, and wonders where the church is no longer going to be marked by what comes out of her mouth, but by the power that comes out of her hand. Where we're not going to be looking. Prophets are for one reason. John, who did no miracle. The scripture says John did no miracle. John, who did no miracle, activated Jesus in his miracle ministry. The only reason there is prophetic gifting in your life is to activate the substance of the power of God in your life. And when that happens, the prophetic diminishes. The, the critical point of the prophet is to work himself out of a job. The demonstration of the Spirit activating in you the demonstration of the power. That way you don't need, I must decrease. The I that the prophet is must decrease. 
that He might increase on the inside of you. John didn't get that. A lot of prophets today aren't getting that. And they're going to have to lose their head. They're going to have to, who's their head? Jesus. They're going to have to deviate from the headship of Christ in order to maintain their agenda or they're going to yield themselves to what God is saying and release the prophetic reality of what God is pouring through them to activate the people of God and the church will walk out of the bridal season having conceived and bringing forth what the Bible calls a man-child. It's, it's an iteration. It's something that we have yet to experience and we're going to see a manifestation of the power of God. A manifestation of signs, yeah. miracles, and wonders yeah. on a scale that even the Scripture does not approach to. And it's our portion and it's not waiting for a period of time. It's not waiting for a moment. We're already 13 years into the third day. It's available. We're in that time. Bright weddings don't last forever. He wants to bring it to a conclusion. Take the draw and allow Him to do that which He purposed to do. Father God, we thank You. We want You to take Your drink. We want You to take Your draw to the vice. Because we hear you, Lord, that you're thirsty. We know that you're thirsting. And we don't want you to be at this uh, nuptial celebration and not take your draught of who we are. We want you to experience the fullness of all that you want to partake of in us. And we want to allow you to fill us up. That the water of the washing, the sanctifying power of the word, Lord, it become more than mental. It become something that has that intoxicating effect. We're looking for the intoxicants of who you are, Father, to be made manifest in our life. And we release that. Even as we release that word, Lord, let this word bring these people up to that line of demarcation that you described as filled to the brim. Because when they're filled to the brim, they're only, uh, the only thing that happens next is the transformation of what's on the inside of them. Not releasing what they don't have, but transforming what they already do have. Thank you for your goodness, Father. Yes, yes. thank you, Father. I encourage you to hide that word in your heart and take it with you. Allow it to gestate on the inside of you because surely it will produce, surely it will produce what he's placed on the inside. Once you've been over, they say alcoholics say once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Once that intoxicant prevails in your life, it will dominate you for the rest of your existence. I want to be swallowed up yeah. of Him. Yeah. It's available. Thank you. It's, it's present. Take, take, this, take a, this vintage with you, says the Father. Praise God. Amen. What, uh, what Russ released uh, is your portion. You hear what he said? This is your season. This is your portion. Your portion has been released to you. Not just over the word that he released, but the content whole thing he had to say. It's your season. This is your portion. You're in your three days. And the Lord, you know, earlier when he said what a, like a thing through me about in three days, I didn't know anything about what they were talking about. You have to understand that there is a table set before you, but you've got to pull in on it now. So if you would, I want you to say this with me. Say, this is my portion. This, this is, is my portion. portion. I want, as you're, we're going to say this a number of times. I want you to focus in on you. Don't look. Don't look at me. You'll, you'll be able to hear me. If anything, close your eyes. I want you to see you and the Father. First of all, you're sitting in the Father's lap. How do I know? Big Daddy's here. Is that not true? It's true. I mean, mercy. And so you're sitting in the Father's lap, and I, I and I want you to hear yourself. I want you to think about as you're sitting in the Father's lap. Place yourself there. 
And I want you to say, say, Father, this is my portion. Father, this, is my this is my season. This is my season. You made this my time. You made this my time. This is my night. This is my night. And this is my three days. And this is my three days. Lord, I will be resurrected. I will be resurrected. And I'm coming alive. That that tried to evade me. That that tried to evade me. I have now apprehended. I have now apprehended by the help of you, Holy Spirit. By the help of you, Holy Spirit. This is my portion. This is my portion. My portion. My portion. My time. My time. My anointing. My anointing. My anointing. My anointing. From you. From you. I will not hold back. I will not hold back. And I will speak. I will speak. You made me to be a teacher. You made me to be a teacher. You made me to be a preacher. And I accept this call on my life. Accept this call on my life because you are able through me to win. I shall win as I accept your word. As I accept your word. And as I speak it forth. I am this word. I am this word. I am this word. I am this word. I am. I am this word. This word. Amen. Amen.